Hello, Conscious Explorers. Welcome to your favorite spot for mindful awareness and waking up. I'm your host, Michael Neely, and you're listening to Consciously Speaking. Today's guest is Karen Swain. Karen is a spiritual mentor guide, radio host, author, inspirational speaker, filmmaker, and difference maker, enlightening you about the power of your thoughts, beliefs, and how to live in alignment with your emotional guidance system while educating you about how the law of attraction is shaping your life. Karen is one of Australia's foremost thought leaders and change agents, showing you the way to a happier, healthier life through personal sessions, workshops, seminars, festivals, movies, and media. You can find out more about Karen at www.karenswain.com. Welcome to the show, Karen. It's great to have you here. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much. I love the intro. Ah, you said it so well, and you pronounced my name so beautifully. (laughs) Well, thank you. And, you know, I just want to share with our listeners, uh, you and I spoke about that a little bit in our pre-call. Karen often, well, I don't know about everywhere, but everywhere that I've seen it spells it capital K, capital A, and then R-E-N. So, Karen, I'll let you explain the rest. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, Michael, my mother was really insistent that people pronounce the name the way that she intended. And so she used to correct anyone that called me Karen. And if they didn't understand and they kind of looked looked at her with that, uh, she'd say, you know, as in motor car, and she'd be going, brum, brum. And as a kid, I would be like, oh, stop mum from doing the motor car sound. But there must have been a reason. So when I was young, I didn't worry. Everyone called me Karen. We had five Karens in the class. And then as I started to become more conscious and more aware, I realized that maybe there was a reason. My mother's unconscious because she was a very unconscious person, but maybe there was a reason that she insisted on that. So the name of the light body is called the car body, spelt K-A. And it's the vehicle that we use when we're not using our physical vehicle to sort of travel around the universe. And a lot of people talk about still being in their physical form when they have NDEs, near-death experiences, and they go off and they speak to people on the other side and have these lovely adventures outside their body. So it's the vehicle that our consciousness uses to drive around this physical universe. So I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. Maybe there is a reason that my mother insisted on calling me Karen and not Karen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love it. That's excellent. (laughs) So, Karen, can you share with our (laughs) listeners who is Karen the woman and what is she up to here on our third rock from the sun? (laughs) Oh, wow, Michael, that's a big question. Look, life is just too much fun. What am I up to? I'm up to a lot of things. I'm up to too many things. I'm a bit like you. Like you, Michael, I'm someone who loves people and I have that inquisitive mind. I think that this awakening of the planet that's going on right now is not up to me alone. I think when a lot of people put themselves out there as spiritual teachers, they might feel like they're really alone in this voice and this message that they have. If you look at a lot of people that have had near-death experiences and they come back armed with all this knowledge, they try to tell people around them and they go, oh, no, you're crazy. I I don't believe in all that stuff. And so I believe the message is better when we come together. And so like you, I interview people about their stories and their message. You know, together we have one voice and together we can raise the consciousness of this planet with our stories and our teachings and specifically our stories. I think that, that our life story is really the, our message to the world. It makes you want to jump out of bed and tackle the day. <laughs> What lights me up in the morning? Look, mm-hmm. I, I, to be really honest with you, Michael, I am not lit up in the morning. I am oh, not okay. one of those people that jump out of bed and say, yes, I'm going to do a yoga class. In the morning, I try to remember what has gone on the night before. So when I wake up in the morning, I suppose the ritual is getting up and going to the toilet like most people. Go, uh, I go back to I, bed and then I, I try to remember what's happened during the yeah. night. I heard Oprah Winfrey ask that question, what's your morning ritual to all her guests? And I thought about mine and I thought, ooh, I don't have a very sort of springy morning ritual. It's it's more of a meditative morning ritual. Mm. And I savour the fact that I can lounge in bed and do that so I don't jump up and have to go to a nine to five, which is delicious actually. But I try to remember what's gone on during the night because we re-emerge every night back to our broader perspective, back to our soul's perspective. And then we come back through the veil, through the forgetfulness, back into our consciousness and our personality 
disease and the craziness and the busyness of what we're doing down here, what we think that we need, where we're going, that human race, you know, we get back in the race. And so what I try to do every morning is to remember where I've been during the night and try to reconnect to that. Mm, mm. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes <laughs> I only remember my dreams and they often don't make sense. Sometimes they unfold because what happens to us when we reemerge back into our physical from our nightly adventures is that we hit all our beliefs, our subconscious beliefs and our ideas and our thoughts and what we're grappling with. You know, how can I make my podcast work or how can I do this or how can I get my message out there more or whatever it is that you're grappling with? How can I find my lover, get more money? And we hit all those ideas that make us think we can or we can't. And those ideas play out as our dreams. And so our dreams are very revealing as to what we believe about ourselves. They're a beautiful guidance and often negative dreams show you where you f you're blocked, where you feel blocked with an idea or achieving something. Because I believe that we come as genius creators and that every thought holds creative potential. And so every thought's creating our life and our dreams are a beautiful way of finding out what we believe and what we feel we can do and we can't do. And they play out as these crazy dreams that we have. So it's quite nice to, to sit in the morning and reflect what what was going on as I was coming back into my physical body from my nightly adventures? Mm, nice. Karen, I'm curious, you know, so much of what I mentioned in your bio, you have, you've got a vast array of things that you do. So what would you say if someone was to ask, okay, what's your profession or what's on your business card? Yeah. What would your title be? And could you tell us why? You know, Michael, that has been something that I've been grappling with all my life because I don't know what my title is. What I say to people is I'm a teacher of deliberate creation and they say, what? What's <laughs> that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then I've gone, I've reached out to coaches and, and to people to help me sort of market myself and they've said, that's too confusing. You can't say that. You've got to call yourself a coach, a life coach, an intuitive, something that people understand. And I think to myself, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll take your advice. It's really interesting when you think you should take these well-meaning people's advice. Mm -hmm. And then I listen to my own guidance and my own guidance says, don't listen to what other people think you should be. Just be who you are in the world and let other people not understand it. But when they don't understand it, they ask questions. And that's the beauty of the human mind. When you don't understand something, the human mind immediately wants to know why. That's why I put the capital A in my name. Why do you mm -hmm. put the capital A in your name so that you pronounce it the way that my mother insisted? You know, it's, it's really to create that question in somebody. If I said to someone, I'm a life coach, they go, oh, God, another life coach. <laughs> There's so many life coaches right. out there. But a teacher of deliberate creation is showing you that every thought has creative power. And so when you're deliberate in what you think and how you feel, you become the master of your destiny. You become the master of your life. You, you work in alignment with your dreams and you don't push against them. So that's what I call myself, a teacher of deliberate creation. And I teach through my own teaching, but I teach through other people's stories as well. I love putting people on radio that's had some challenge. They've changed their perspective on life. They've transformed themselves and then they've gone on to live the life that they want or the life that they dream about. And that is teaching people how deliberate creation is working. It's, it's using mm. their life story as an example of how we can have what we want, how we are genius creators and that we can create deliberately. We can create on purpose. And of course, one of my favorite teachers, I've got a few favorite teachers is Esther Hicks, the teachings of Abraham, Esther and Jerry Hicks. Mm -hmm. And Byron Katie is another one of my favorite teachers, beautiful spiritual mm -hmm. teacher. Wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you mentioned your radio show there. Could you share with our listeners about your show, how it differs from a podcast and how one could get access to it from anywhere in the world? <laughs> well, like you, Michael, I thought to myself, how can I expand this message of consciousness, help people more? And I said to a friend of mine who was a psychic, I'm thinking of doing a radio show. I was inspired by that silly show, Fraser, on television, you know, that show. And, her, and he was spruiking all this sort of help on radio. Mm -hmm. Although it's a comedy show and much of what he said was <laughs> silly, it was just, it was inspiring. And I thought, hmm, 
hmm, maybe, maybe we could do that. Maybe I could do guidance, have people call in and do some teaching on radio. And so I put it to Pam and she was really the person that said, okay, let's make this happen. She was the one that went full steam, full steam ahead. We contacted our local community radio station where we lived. I lived in a different place at the time. And the two of us put together this show where she would, we would ask people to ring in. We got no listeners. We had to find the listeners. We had to go out to people and say, can you call (laughs) in? Because we had no listeners. And, and ask questions. And Pam would do a psychic reading and I would do the law of attraction thing. And so we did that for about six months and we had a lot of fun. And then Pam's husband retired and she went off sailing with her husband. And I thought, well, that, that, I'll have to change the format of my show. I also changed stations to a bigger station that actually did have an audience. And I wasn't allowed to do talk back because we didn't have a seven second delay. So that's when I started doing the interviews and I started putting people's stories on the show instead of doing guidance. I started putting people's stories on the show. And uh, so that's how it started. That was about four years ago. And it's been evolving. And I've interviewed some incredible, amazing people doing amazing things some beautiful difference makers that are really making a difference in all aspects of the world in peace and consciousness, in the environment, Mm -hmm. in, um, you know, I spoke to, John of God came out to Australia, I spoke to Diego, who um, travels the world with John of God, I don't know if you've heard of John of God, he's a spiritual healer in Brazil, and and musicians, conscious musicians that are using their talent and their music to get a message out there of love and kindness and hope, and, and other teachers that are putting on sessions, soul sessions, and teaching intuition and creating entrepreneurs, unstoppable entrepreneurs that are out there making a difference with their products. A lot of Mm. charities, like there's an amazing charity called Oz Harvest, which takes all the food from restaurants. Well, not all of it, but as much as they can get, there's there's an army of volunteers that goes around collecting food from restaurants and supermarkets that would throw it out. And then they take it to a kitchen that feeds it to the poor. And uh, that's become huge. Ronnie Khan, who's a friend of mine, she was awarded the Order of Australia for her work in Oz Harvest. So, yeah, it's so much fun. It's so much fun meeting yeah. these. It changed my life, you know. It's not my life is not all about me. It's about it's it's about other people. Like, who are you, and what are you doing to mm-hmm. make a difference? And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. And well, Karen, your radio show being you know broadcast is it a daily show? No, I just do it once a week on a Saturday. Weekly show broadcast in Sydney, Australia. I mean, how would someone here in the United States listen to that? Or is that why you created the podcast, so you can make it available? Yeah, well, I podcast my interviews. I podcast all my interviews. So they're on my website, karenswain.com slash listen. And you can also stream it. We're on Saturday morning here in Australia between 8 and 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which is probably a Friday night in the States, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And at fm99.3.com.au, you can stream it. And I'll put a link. I'll put a link on the podcast. And also I'm on Soul Traveller Radio, which is a new internet radio station that broadcasts in 150 countries and that is all conscious music all the time and they and my show comes on a Sunday night and a Wednesday night there at 7 p.m. Yeah, so mm. you could go to soultravelerradio.com and see it there and, and when you go on their website, it's beautiful. The music comes on straight away. It's a mix between kirtan, sort of yoga, meditation music mm-hmm. and pop and rock and reggae and funk. But all the music that's played on the show, all the message of the music has a conscious message. So it's a beautiful mm-hmm. station. I love it. Oh, cool. Yeah. I definitely want to check that one out. Yeah. So Karen, Karen, <laughs> I got to get into the <laughs> habit of this. So Karen, who were some of the major influences on your path? You mentioned Byron Katie and Esther Hicks. Were there any other people that stand out as someone that you learned from that go, okay, this is my path now? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Well, my story is that I was one of those kids that was just insanely curious. I'm still insanely curious. One of those kids that would harass her parents. But why? But why? But why? And you know, but why do, Why does religion say that you have to be <laughs> baptized? I don't understand. Why? How can mm-hmm. a baby be born in sin? I don't understand. Why? And my mother, who was not religious or spiritual in any way, shape or form, or my father would just say, 
oh, do you need to know these things? It's like, just ask your father. And my father would say, look, ask your mother. (laughs) (laughs) And so she got sick when I was in my early teens and um, she had about four years of grappling with cancer and died. Lots of things happened before that. But like all great spiritual teachers, our past is fraught with drama because I think that, you know, when I was learning naturopathy, when you, what did they say? When you traumatize the nail, it grows faster. And I thought that's a great analogy for life, isn't it? The trauma Mm -hmm. in your life makes you grow faster. So as a young child, I had a lot of trauma. There was lots of abuse and then sickness and death and all that beautiful stuff that makes you grow faster. But after she died, I started asking more questions like, but why? Where did she go? What, where do we come from? And one of my first books was Shirley MacLaine. Oh, <laughs> Shirley MacLaine was one of the yeah. first. I was working on Hamilton Island, which is a, a resort on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And I was at a bar and this boy, I'm, you know, I'm good looking, having a ball. I'm like 19 and this man chats me up at the bar and he says, do you want to go for a drive in my buggy? And I go, yeah, sure, because they had these little golf carts that went around the island. So we're driving around. He says, do you want to come up to my room? And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. But something, I didn't really want to go up to his room, but something inside me said, yeah, let's do it. So we went up to his room and on his coffee table was this book, Dancing in the Light by Shirley MacLaine. And I was into dancing at the time and I said, oh, what's that book? about is that about dancing he said I'm going to make us a drink and then come out on the balcony and I'm going to start I want to tell you something and we went out on the balcony and he started telling me about Shirley MacLaine and her journey and the whole the whole spiritual encyclopedia opened up in that moment and we sat there speaking all night about things like reincarnation and life after life and oh my god I was just fascinated I was like Mm -hmm. I couldn't get enough of it and you know I don't even remember that man's name I had that interlude with that guy we sat there speaking all night I never saw him again after that but he woke me up he pointed me in the direction to find literature that woke me up so he said if you read her books start with the first book and read them consecutively which is exactly what I did and I couldn't get enough of it I was just devouring spiritual (laughs) books I was like Oh my God, I want to know more. Those, those burning questions inside me, which is, were ignited by this information that was coming through. So Shirley was definitely one of the influences. And then years later, I've had so many amazing experiences. I was reading a book about journeys on the other side when you go to sleep. And I was really crying out to the universe. I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to know who my guides are, meet my spirit guides. And and every night when I'd go to sleep, I'd set the intention to have these journeys and to wake up and remember them as this person who'd written this book did. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Then one night it did. So I'm having a dream. In the dream, I'm in a class and I'm asking the person, how do we move from dimensions on the other side? And I'm always very conscious in my dreams. I always know that I'm there and that I'm having that experience. It's like I'm not in my physical body. And this person said, oh, you need to put this different light in your different chakras. It's not like the normal chakra system down on earth. It's a different light. You use a different frequency. And then as you evoke that frequency, you can move from dimension to dimension. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool. So I did. And then I found myself sort of waking up into a new dimension. And there was this man with a turban offering me a little glass of liqueur. And I looked at him and I looked at the glass of liqueur and I looked at him and I said, can we drink while we're in spirit? And then I looked around and Shirley MacLaine was sitting at a table laden with beautiful food, like this beautiful, like Alice in Wonderland table. And she looked at me, she says, yeah, of course you can drink. You can't get drunk. You don't have a physical body. (laughs) We had a laugh (laughs) and I said, oh, I'll have that drink then. And we sat at the table and I said, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I'm one of your teachers. And I looked at her and I said, are you? And she said, oh, God, Karen, do you think that it was any coincidence that mine was the first book you ever picked up? And I went, oh, I suppose not. (laughs) And I had this amazing experience with Shirley. A whole lot of other people started to join us. We're having this great conversation. She was showing movies of her dancing. And then I felt like I was in an earthquake, Michael. And I grabbed the table and I looked up at these people and I said, what's happening? And they just looked at me and smiled. The next thing I knew, I was back in my room, in my bedroom. I wasn't in my body. I wasn't out of my body. I had the awareness of being both in and out of the body, but I could see through all the walls. 
everything was translucent. So I was having what is deemed an out-of-body experience, but I wasn't looking down at my body. I was just conscious that I was in my room and I could see through all the walls and I could see my daughter, who was about eight at the time, waking up and then coming down the hallway to wake me up. And I had this realisation that my body had called me back. And that earthquake that I experienced while I was having this party on the other side with Shirley MacLaine and friends was like the rumblings of my my body saying, time to come back, your daughter's about to wake you up. And it was just the most delicious feeling and experience. And I remember she came and she was shaking me, mom, mom, get up, get up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't want this experience to end. So I'm I'm still, but I'm in my body, I'm behind my eyeballs, but I'm still outside of my body simultaneously and then she got sort of impatient and thought oh she's not going to wake up and went into the kitchen to make herself something and then mum kicked in and and said oh I better get up and make her some breakfast and as soon as Mm -hmm. I had that thought bang I'm I'm back in normal consciousness and I'm up and I'm sort of walking through the house thinking wow what just happened (laughs) yeah it was very cool very cool I've had lots of amazing experiences like that yeah, what was well, the question? Who was your influences? Well, she was Yeah, wonderful. yeah. Conversation with God, Neil Donald Walsh, he was another mm-hmm. one of my influences. So I had read about a million spiritual books at this stage, <laughs> thought I knew everything. <laughs> Isn't it funny when you think you know everything? And I uh, was a bit over it because I'd been sort of on this trajectory of, of researching for so long and it gets a bit tiring. That inquiring mind gets very tiring after a while. And I remember thinking one day, I don't want to think about this stuff anymore. I want to go out, I want to drink alcohol, and I want to talk about nail polish. And I rang up a friend of mine who likes to party, and I said, where are you going tonight? She said, we're going out to a bar. I said, right, I'm joining you. And she introduces me to this young man who tells me about his near-death experience in India and how he broke his arm and went to a healer and it miraculously healed. And, and I'm thinking, I can't get away from this. <laughs> I can't get away from this. And then I go home. I had a book called Angels and it was a beautiful illustrated book of all these people dressed in angel costumes with the story of how the angelic realm is always with you. And this young Mm -hmm. man that I had been speaking to in this bar was one of the angels in the book with these massive wings on. And I just laughed and laughed. And I said to my guides, I can run, but I can't hide. (laughs) They said, that's right, Karen. (laughs) (laughs) That girlfriend who I didn't think was very conscious at the time, but she is really. She just doesn't talk about it as much as me. Mm. She had said to me, she'd had some health issues and she said, she was really upset and she said, the only thing that's given me any solace is that book, Conversations with God. And I thought, oh God, here we go, another book. And I thought, well, I've had the message, maybe I should go and buy this book. So I went off and bought the book. And then the same day that I bought the book, I had a knock from the little boy who lived upstairs, a knock on the door. And he goes, Karen, Karen, there's a package for you in the mail. There's a package for you in the mail. And I opened the door and he was holding this little package, sweet little thing, looking up at me. And I said, oh, thank you. And as I put my hand on the package, I knew that it was the book Conversations with God. My cousin who lived in Switzerland, all the way over in Switzerland, had found the book insisted that because I woke her up she'd she'd come to Australia and she was in a a mess and I'd woken her up to who she was and why she was on the planet and she was off on her journey of discovery so she'd found the book and she'd sent it to me right at the same day that I bought that book it was amazing he came out to Australia and I organized a book signing for him in one of our um, new age bookshops here in Australia and someone had given him some crystals, a big pink crystal ball. And because he was travelling around Australia, well, he was travelling the world really, he couldn't carry these bowling balls sort of things in his luggage. And so he gave me this beautiful pink crystal ball. So I've got this magnificent pink crystal ball sitting here in my house that was given to me by Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote the book Conversations with God, which, which was a book that really woke me up. That book calls you into action you know what are you going to do with this knowledge armed with this knowledge who are you going to teach how are you going to spread this knowledge it really called me into action and I started having conversation with God groups in my house and people would come and I just wanted to have a conversation with people I wanted people to have the same conversation that I'd been having with my books 
but they would sit there waiting for me to teach them and I'd be like, I'm not here to teach anybody. I'm just here to have a conversation. But every week it was the same deal. People would would look at me wanting me to teach them and I thought, hmm, something's going on here. Maybe I need to start stepping up to the plate and start teaching people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of the people that came who transitioned a couple of years ago actually, he introduced me to a group of people called the Academy of Light and that was a group of people that put on speakers every week that would talk about all sorts of conscious things, meditation and and astral traveling and different realms of consciousness and chakras and, oh, you know, all that delicious stuff. And I became one of the coordinators of the Academy of Light, putting on speakers and organizing workshops for them. And uh, it was a labor of love and I did it for years. It expanded from one group in Sydney to seven groups around New South Wales, which is the state that we live in, during the time I was there because it really started to expand. But it was a labour of love and it was all volunteer work and I was working full time at it and I thought, no, this is crazy. I've got to start working on my own stuff. But then I find myself years later doing the same thing on radio, putting other speakers on radio. So I can't get away from it. And then I have to figure, (laughs) it's just not all about me. This life is not all about me and my message. It's about other people's messages as well. It's about sharing. Yeah, it's about sharing the love. And as much as I try and make it all about me, it never works. It's always, you know, it's always about others as well. Like include others in your life. You, you're not the only messenger. There's a many messengers out there. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I know that you also do have your own message as well. And as one of your hyphenates, you are also an author. And your, your book, Return to Love, when did that come out? And could you share with our listeners what that book is about and who it's geared towards? For sure. Well, During this long journey (laughs) of physical life, a lot of psychics had come to me and said to me that I would be an author, I would be a writer. And as a kid, I'm this dyslexic kid that hates reading and can't spell. And I'm thinking, that's never going to happen. And somebody said, oh, you can do and, you know, can talk into dictaphones and get it typed up these days. and So So I was grappling with that a few years ago. So I wrote the book about mm, probably eight or nine years ago now. And thinking, well, if I'm going to write a book, what the, what, what the hell, what the heaven am I going to write about? And I was grappling with it and grappling with it. And my guide said to me, because I've got a group of beings that I call blissful beings who are my guidance. I used to call them the mob or the gang. And then I had a furniture shop called Bliss. And then I changed, I went from that into teaching and I called my business Blissful Beings. And they said to me one day laughing, because they laugh at me a lot. They said, who do you think blissful beings are? And I said, oh, it's you, Mob. They said, absolutely. (laughs) So they said to me, write about what you know. And I would had many dreams, especially from my mother when she had passed. I was 16 when mum died or transitioned. And she used to come back to me. And in my dreams, she was there. And she always said to me, I didn't die. And when I was young, I was really pissed off. I said, what do you mean you didn't die? She said, no, I didn't die, Karen. And I would scream and yell at her and say, where the hell have you been if you didn't die? And I was really angry. And I'd have these reoccurring dreams over and over again after she passed when I was younger. And then I realized that her message, so that was, in, that was my interpretation of what had gone on at night on another plane, but I could only interpret it through my limiting beliefs and subconscious ideas of who I am in this. And so that's why it was a traumatic experience for me when I was young because the conscious me thinks that if you don't die, then you're still in your physical form and that she'd been hiding out in some other city and not talking to me. And so I was really upset, not understanding that there's no such thing as death. But obviously we we leave this physical plane. And then I had a lot of people that I knew that had died, three best friends, My best friend, Kate, who um, I was there when she gave birth to her son and another girl that I went to school with who was born thalidomide affected. She lasted till she was 40. She was born with a hole in her heart. Do you remember the drug thalidomide in the 60s? I do. A drug given to um, pregnant women for morning sickness and the babies Mm -hmm. that came out had a lot of deformities. And, and a lot of friends, that, and all of them came back to tell me that they didn't die. All of them, every single one of them had that same message. Nikki, who was my friend that had thalidomide, she, in a dream one night, she said, uh, we were having a chat, just normal sitting around chatting. And I said, oh, I looked at her, I said, aren't you dead? And she said, no, I'm not dead. I said, yes, you are, you're dead. And she said, no, I'm not dead. I said, 
I know you're dead. I went to your funeral. I sat next to your sister and I cried. And, and she said, I didn't die, Karen. So we're having this argument and it was hysterical. We were exactly the same in physical life. We would be like husband and wife. We used to argue all the time. Anyway, the next morning I had Nikki, you know, all over me, con- my consciousness, because I just dreamt about her having an argument, how she didn't die. I rang a mutual friend and I said, how are you? She said, oh, I had the strangest dream. I, I, I dreamt of Nikki last night. I said, oh, did you? What was in the dream? She said, oh, she came to tell me she didn't die. (laughs) (laughs) I I need to write about this. And so the book, Return to Love, is the message that my friends on the other side have given me, both the ones that have been physically focused and the ones that are not physically focused. And my experiences and and like all of it, it's other people's stories as well. So it's mm. stories of, of a good friend of mine when her brother passed, she had this experience of him showing her what heaven was like. Another friend had a near-death experience, he drowned, and he followed the music. You know, a lot of people follow the light, he followed the music. I loved mm. that story. So it's my story and a compilation of other people's stories. So mm. it's really about r- returning to love, that place that we come from, that our source is pure positive energy and love, unconditional love. One of the, my favorite things to do is to go on YouTube and listen to people's stories of their near death because they speak about it from that memory. And when they speak about it, they evoke that energy and you can tune into that energy and you can feel that beautiful, blissful, divine energy that they're talking about, which is our source, that source of pure positive energy. So that's one of my favorite things to do is to listen to people with near-death experiences. And he was feeling that, this person I wrote about, he was feeling that with music, that music was evoking that beautiful energy. So returning to love and feeling that you, you don't have to die to do it. You can, you can return to love right here, right now. Mm-hmm. Just evoke that pure positive energy, that bliss. What lights you up? What makes you feel good? You can do it by patting the cat, loving someone you love, cuddling a baby. That's a good way to do it. Mm, You can do it by focusing on anything that makes you feel beautiful and blissful and happy and excited and passionate. Or you can listen to Michael's (laughs) podcasts. So, Karen, you've mentioned a couple of times about people that you have relationships, them not necessarily being conscious, specifically about your parents, your mother, and potentially one of your friends. How do you define consciousness or conscious living? Ooh, that is such a great question, Michael. How do I define? Well, um, I think that consciousness is the awareness of how your thoughts have an impact not only on your life but on others. I guess that how I used to define consciousness when I was younger and I was judging people for being conscious or not, with people that were into what I was into, the books that I was reading, the conversation I was having. And what was really interesting about my friend who I didn't define as conscious is that she is and was and always has been an incredibly beautiful, kind, loving soul. And she's a giver and she's like me. She's someone that just can't help but give. You know, when she meets someone, she's like, how can I help you? What can I do to serve Mm. you? And so in that she was very conscious, but she was not aware of how her thoughts were creating her reality. So when drama would hit, she would talk about it endlessly as women love to do. They get together in gangs and bitch and carry on and talk about their dramas. And she would kind of dramatize the drama. She would just really get into the drama. And then more drama would happen and more drama would happen. So, you -hmm. know, you cannot focus on something and not bring more of it to you. And this is what I perceive as conscious today. Someone that's aware that what you think and feel directly affects your reality. And so when you're focusing on something that you don't like, focus on it, think about it, beat the drum of it repeat that story over and over in your head. You know, when you have an argument with someone, I should have said mm-hmm. that and I should have said that. And then you tell all your friends about how that person's wrong. like that. And let me tell you why they're wrong. And let, let, let me tell you my point of view. And you don't realize that as you keep focusing on it with your thoughts and your mind and your, and your words and your actions, you're bringing more of that same vibration into your life. And so deliberate creation 
is accentuating the positive in anything that's happening to you. What's the gift? What am I learning? What am I seeing about myself in this? So when the drama hits, because this is a contrasting environment that we live in, and I'm going to guarantee that drama is going to hit. And as I said before, it's in the drama, often in the trauma, that there is accelerated growth. So when it hits, the question is always, rather than beating the drama of what's going wrong, what am I learning about myself? What can I mm -hmm. learn from this? And of course, when the drama hits, so you get sick, you immediately launch rockets, as Esther Hicks would say from the teachings of Abraham. You launch a rocket of desire, shoots out of you and says, I want to be well. And so there is a dream or a desire that you've put out into your future that you're now on a journey to fulfilling. And that journey is an emotional journey. And that's a conscious person that understands that how they feel is an indication of their vibration and that their vibration attracts. So when you're sick, another example is I had a client send me an email yesterday and say that she had contracted TB and she'd been hanging out with very high vibrational beings, monks and spiritual teachers and healers. And so my guidance to her was, what's upsetting you? What are you feeling stifled about? Because TB is something, it's an infection in the lungs. And when you're infected in a place, it really speaks to what consciousness, what vibration you've been carrying in order to allow dis-ease or a lack of ease in that area of your body. And she came back to me straight away. She said, yes, I was really upset about this. I was really upset about that. And so we looked at how that was teaching her, how that was expanding her growth. And as soon as you tune in to what you're gaining from the problem and not the problem, the dis-ease disappears. And that happened to me when my father died. He was married to a woman, his third wife, who didn't want to know anything about us. And during the preparations for his funeral, my brother, my younger brother, from my mother, not from her, really wanted to speak at the funeral. And she wouldn't allow it because she said in her words that it was going to be a very elegant affair and that he was not sophisticated enough to speak at his own father's funeral. That was her idea. He's a very sophisticated man, but that was her idea because she wanted to control. And I got very angry, <laughs> as you can imagine. And as I felt that anger welling up inside me, I got instantly sick instantly because the anger was white anger I don't know if you've ever been that angry that you can't speak it's not an anger like you want to yell at everybody it's an anger that you're so angry that you can't speak like someone looks at you and you just can't speak I don't know if you've ever been that angry that's how angry I felt wow I don't and, know that I have <laughs> you know if you have, and that discord in my vibration that dis-ease in my vibration had me instantly sick instantly sick and so that sickness was um, you know like a cold my throat swelled up I couldn't like I literally couldn't speak and my chest squeezed up and oh look, it was awful and I thought oh I've got to change my vibration how can I make peace with this situation how can I make peace so I made peace with the situation in my mind I spoke to the priest who was at the church who was doing the service and he and I had this beautiful philosophical conversation and, and it was a lovely conversation. I was making peace and I just let it lie. And I literally felt the disease, the cold and the flu symptoms leave my body as I was making peace with this. I was making peace with my stepmother and her, her very unconscious ways, I suppose, and just allowing her to be who she was. And then overnight, she had a change of mind and she rang my brother and said he could speak. Yeah, so as I made peace with the whole situation, everything shifted, like the whole thing mm -hmm. shifted. I didn't have to yell at her and force her or do any, I didn't have to take any sort of action. I just had to make peace with myself because my guidance system, which is my emotions and my body was telling me I'm resisting what I want to happen. What I wanted to happen mm -hmm. was I wanted my brother to speak at his father's funeral. Interesting enough, when I spoke to my brother the next day, he said, I wouldn't have listened to her anyway. I would have just got up at the church and spoke whether <laughs> she let me or not. <laughs> right, who's going to stop him? <laughs> no one was going to stop me, Karen. And I thought, yeah, I don't think in a church you could make a commotion about that, could you? No, not at all. <laughs> it's so fascinating how our thoughts can create. And when you're really aware of it, you can see it happening instantly. When you make peace with where you are, when you have an emotion or an illness that doesn't feel good, it's your guidance system saying, what are you resisting? What are you pushing up against? 
And when you make peace with where you are, all that just melts away miraculously, beautifully. And I've healed broken bones like that. I've healed cancer. I've brought people back from the brink of death just by helping them make peace. I was um, talking to a young man who had been in a bike accident. I was massaging at the time and I was massaging his mother and she was feeling so much relief from my hands and the energy that I was evoking. She said to me, can you come and do some work on my son? He's very ill. I'm here in Sydney because I'm staying here because he's in a hospital and um, could you come and look at him? And I said, sure. So I went into the hospital and he was a skeleton. He was like six foot four and he weighed like 36 kilos. And I don't know how many pounds that is, but it's very light. And he was just a skeleton. There was nothing to massage. I couldn't massage him. Wow. But I just spoke to him and I spoke to him about making a choice of being here or not being here. And he'd incurred a staph infection. So he was a very sick young man. And um, I did some, what I was doing at the time, Reiki, put some hands on him and just spoke from that higher guidance and just spoke to him about choices. And and he healed overnight. The next day he woke up and uh, started eating. And I came back in about four or five days later and all the nurses came running up to me and they said, what did you do? What did you do to him? What did you do to him? And I said, why, why? They said, after you left, everything changed. Everything changed. He started eating. He's put on five kilos in five days. The staph infection's gone. His bones are healing. What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> and I said at the time, I was just this young girl, like was doing massage. I said, I just did Reiki. Oh, what's Reiki? Oh, it's just energy, you know, trans transferring some healing energy and they're going we want to know about that we want to know about that <laughs> but really what it was michael was that decision that he made to live or to die he mm. made a decision i helped him make that decision that's that's what happened once you make the decision i want to be here then life or the universe knocks itself out to support your decision and I've done a lot of healing. I used to be a hands-on healer because after that episode, I started doing more hands-on healing. But what I noticed is if people have made a decision they don't want to be here or they want to stay in their illness, no amount of zapping them with your healing energy is going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. we, we are deliberate creators. We come to make choices and it's us. It's up to us. It's up to us to make those choices. People can help you make those choices, but we're the ones that choose. We're the ones that choose to live or die. We're the ones that make all the decisions and the power is within us. So any healer is just someone that shows you that, that the power is within you. Mm. And uh, yeah. yeah. I'm with you 100% there, Karen. Yeah. So they're the people I like to talk to. Mm. I like to use people's life to demonstrate that the power was within them so if it was within them it's within you too mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so Karen what are you up to right now that you'd like to share with our listeners <laughs> well, what do you got going I'm on? talking to you baby <laughs> yeah 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 I know I know I know, I know. <laughs> and, and that's great I love that you're present with that there are so many things I had an extraordinary couple of weeks actually so I put a friend of mine on the show, Corrie. She was bringing out a saint called Mother Mira. And Mother Mira is this, she lives in Germany. When I was on this this intense search for, for meaning when I was reading all my books, I remember, you know, reading about Mother Mira. There, I've got something else to share with you if you've got time. I had another experience where I was massaging a, a Hollywood movie star that was out here because I used to work in the film industry catering and, and when I was massaging, she had a picture of a guru on an Indian guru, a man with long hair and beads and, you know, and the orange robe on her dresser. And I remember massaging her and, and saying to my guides or to myself, what's all this Indian guru stuff about? And as I had that, as I asked that question, I had this experience of my head expanding, like it was a visceral, physical sensation. I literally felt like my physical skull was expanding. It was like, whoo, like Alice in Wonderland when she bites the, I was expanding mm. and I'm massaging this woman, having this sensation thinking, what is going on? And I felt like my ears were touching the walls. I had this big head, isn't it interesting? People say you've got a big head. 
and I started downloading all this information. And she, and this Hollywood movie star was on an intense search for meaning in her life too. And she was experiencing a lot of physical pain. And she was running around from healer to healer looking for reasons why she was in pain. And she was doing yoga and physiotherapy. And she was doing everything physical to try and fix it. She was a meditator as well. But I started channeling and downloading all this information, telling her why she was on the planet and why things happened to her life and gave her insights into her future and insights into her past. But I'm this young massage therapist and I'm thinking, I don't know any of this stuff. Like, what's happening? And as I'm telling her all this stuff about her life, my ego is saying, you can't tell her that. You don't know that. What are you saying? Shut up. Stop saying it. But the energy and the information was coming through so forcefully that I could not stop my mouth from yapping. Just yap, 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 yap. And then after I finished massaging her, I left and I just went, whoa, what was that about? And I had the headache from hell for about three days because my consciousness was not in a place of receiving that sort of download. And so I started to really look into Indian gurus and consciousness. That search became even more intense after that experience. And I remember reading about Mother Mira and she comes out to Australia now and she does darshan. So she doesn't speak, she just transmits loving energy and when she looks into your eyes. And anyway, my friend said, would you like a private audience with her? So I had a bit of a private audience with her, had a bit of a chat to her. And then after that, I had a girl staying here from the States called Sasha Cobra, who I'd put on at my Difference Makers events. And she's this amazing teacher. She talks about, she doesn't call it Tantra, but she talks about sexual energy as a use of healing energy and how you can use the sexual energy to help your life. She speaks to a lot of of young people about relationships and relating and a lot of men, we attracted a lot of young men that said, how do I talk to girls? <laughs> how do I approach a girl? It was funny. We had some events here in Sydney. Then I had another amazing girl come out, woman come out from the States called Crystal, who was an incredible psychic I had on the show. And she, we did some readings on the show and she was into mother, Amachi, the hugging mother. Have you heard of the hugging mother? Oh, of course, yes. So the hugging mother was in Australia at the time too. So I went and spent a couple of nights with the hugging mother and I was watching her just be that love that I speak about in the book, Return to Love, like just be the embodiment of unconditional love. And she hugs and she will sit for weeks on end and hug every single person that comes to have a hug. But not only does she hug people, she she just transmits that energy. Her story is quite amazing, actually. She travels the world. She's just an incredible saint on our planet and she raises money she gives she's given like over 22 million dollars to uh, tsunami victims victims of war she's built schools for refugees and oh my god she's amazing her her reach is huge absolutely huge so i had that experience of being uh, with the mother and then uh, somebody gave me a ticket to an Anthony Robbins success, two-day success thing. So I thought, mm, I did Anthony Robbins 20 years ago. Let me revisit what Anthony Robbins is doing on the planet right now. So I went along and there are all these success coaches saying, how much money do you want to make? Do you want to be rich? I'm going to show you how to be rich, which I tried to do a lot of times when I was young and never very successfully. But I sat there thinking, you know, the paradigm is, Make money now, give back later. And I thought, why can't we make money now and give at the same time? Why can't we help the planet while we're making money? So I had this idea of filling the Horden Pavilion, which is a big complex here in Sydney where they were, with a, a ways of putting speakers on that show people how to have an abundant life but also give back at the same time. That was just a thought that came up. I've got to yet get that organised. <laughs> But what was incredible was this back-to-back -back experiences of all these people in my life. The last speaker at that success conference was a man called Nick Vujicic. Have you heard of Nick Vujicic? He is an Australian inspirational speaker. Some people have called him an evangelist. He has hmm. no arms and no legs. He was born that way. Have you seen him? I think I may have seen something on the internet, yeah. but I don't recall the name. His platform is one and a half billion people. Wow. One and a half billion people. 
he was the there was a guy on stage talking about how to be an inspirational speaker and and how to engage your audience and and you know and he had an agency join up to my agency pay me ten thousand dollars and i'll put you on stage and you'll make millions of dollars and you can travel the world with your message and make lots of money and that was very appealing to all these people were appealing to living the abundant life and Nick Vujicic came out with no arms and no legs and he did exactly what this man, he was the most incredibly engaging, inspirational speaker I've ever seen. He is an evangelist, so he will tell you that the devil will get you and Jesus will save your soul. But when he's speaking in a secular crowd like that, not in a church, he, he doesn't do that. You know, He does talk about God, but he doesn't tell you that Jesus will save you from the devil. But he is just the most incredible person and he comes from that place of knowing his mission, knowing why he's on the planet and being completely and totally connected to that unconditional love through his religious beliefs. And of all the people that I'd seen during this intensive two weeks period, the two people that were making the biggest impact on the planet were the people, mother, the hugging mother and Nick Vujicic who were coming from that place of absolute love. And it just really illustrated that you don't have to work too hard at getting your message out there. You just have to be love. Just ramp up your love. Ramp it up as high as you can go. Be more love. Know your mission. Know that you're on the planet for a reason. Know that life is knocking itself out to help you be here and do what you say you decide that you want to do. And don't work too hard at it. Nick Vujicic started speaking. Someone invited him to a school and he had this young girl come up and cry and say, you changed my life. So he decided when he was 17 that he was going to be a speaker. So he started ringing schools. He rang about 50 schools before someone uh, said that they'd have him there as a speaker. He had to get his brother to drive him without arms and legs. Obviously, he doesn't drive. Mm -hmm. He had to bribe his brother to drive him. He was getting paid 50 bucks. He said to his brother, I'll give you the $50. He drove him two hours and he came to this school and he said, how long would you like me to speak? They said, oh, we'd like you to speak for five minutes. And he thought, oh, maybe they've got mm. the whole school there and I'm, uh, at least I'm speaking to the whole school for five minutes. I said, how many people I'll be speaking to? He said, they said, oh, we've got 10 people to <laughs> speak. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so he spent weeks calling people. And, but, you know, he, he took that massive action, as Tony Robbins would say, in the beginning because he knew why he was on the planet. I'm here to speak. Here's a boy with no arms and no legs think he has no future. But he, he was very in touch with his God and he knew that there was a reason that he had no arms and no legs and he'd found his reason and he was here to inspire people. So he, he goes and he speaks for five minutes to these 10 people. He comes home, he locks himself in his bedroom. His mother leaves him alone because she knows how upset. But then the phone started ringing and it rang off the hook ever since. And, you know, once it, that start, it all started there. And he said he never mm. had a marketing plan. He never put himself out there. And he has a platform now of one and a half billion people. He says that heads of states call him up to speak to their countries. You know, he's, wow. yeah. So it was really an illustration for me that we just, we don't have to work too hard, Michael. We just have to be more loving. Just evoke more love. Know why you're here and feel that love of your source. Be love. Mm. Be love. Yeah. Karen, I, I normally end the show with asking my guests to leave our listeners with a juicy pearl of wisdom that they could put to use right now to improve their lives today. It sounds like you just gave them one, but do you have another one that you'd like to leave them with? Oh, darling, I've got plenty of them. <laughs> well, we're short on time, but I think we have time for one more pearl at least. Listen to how you feel. How you feel is your guidance from your guides. I call my guides blissful beings. But if you're not connected to a group of light beings or, or God or your angels or whatever you want to call it, if you don't feel like you're connected to them, life, the universe, God, your, the light beings or your angels are speaking to you through how you feel. So your guidance system is an indication of what vibration you're offering life because your vibration attracts. Every thought holds a vibration and there are different frequencies and different vibrations and you know what that frequency is and what your vibration is by how you feel. So when you feel tired or down or upset or mad or angry, you as a deliberate creator 
can change that. You have choice and power to change that vibration. And that is God's power on earth. There's a question, what is God's power here on earth? And if the answer to that question is what is God's power here on earth, it is your deliberate choosing to change how you feel. And when you do, you become the master manifester. You become a genius creator of your own reality because you're going to hit drama. You're going to hit contrast. Things are going to piss you off. People are going to piss you off. <laughs> Life's going to come at you. You're going to get sick. You're going to have mm -hmm. accidents. But you're going to have fights with people. That's going to happen. But in that moment, you have choice of changing that, of making peace with where you are. And that is the most delicious guidance anyone can tell you that you have the power to change your life by changing how you think and feel it might not always be easy like I was really angry with my stepmother it wasn't easy to love her in that moment you know I had to move incrementally up that emotional scale I had to see her as a very disempowered very sad person and find some sort of compassion find some connection to this person I was hating but find some connection okay her husband's died she's upset she's she's a mean nasty woman but she's upset I hate her but she's upset you know and move up incrementally to a place of feeling at peace and that all is well and when you're back when you return to love, when you're back again, when you've accentuated the positive, you are at power to create what you want. And you don't do it actually. The universe or life does it for you. You just align your energy with what it is that you want. Everything you want, you want because you think in the having of it, you'll feel good. So mm. feel good and you'll have it. Mm. Nice. Great words of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Car. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day down under to join us. What do you guys consider the U.S.? Are we up over if you're down under? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes we call you guys up over, but. Up over. <laughs> no, I think down under is a bit more. Uh, used and up over but uh, yeah. I love look I love the energy and the I love the states when I went to the states a few years ago I felt like a rock star every time I opened my mouth people were like oh my god say something else <laughs> <laughs> right. well hey I do love the Aussie accent but I got to tell you too and I haven't visited Australia in several years now but I love Vegemite and you won't find a lot of Americans who I do, know. but I love it. I know. That's amazing that you love Vegemite. I love it too. That's another morning ritual, Vegemite on toast. Oh, <laughs> oh it's wonderful. You know, and it's, the, it's very difficult to find here in the United States. I actually had to order it from England. Uh, and have it shipped. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. There Not, are you, some, you won't find it here. There are some shops that do sell it in the States. Uh, well, you'll have to turn me on to them. Because, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I seriously, said, I finally had to go online. I'll and send I you some over, come. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I had a friend coming over from Australia, and I said, just bring me some Vegemite, please, and maybe some VB, because I also love VB. <laughs> uh, but he couldn't bring it. Apparently, it was, at that point, for some reason or another, it wasn't allowed to be brought into the United States. Wow. And I don't know if that still goes on because I did manage to get some shipped to me. So Yeah, you know. I'll, I'll ship you some. <laughs> they do it in little little plastic tubes so that you can ship it easily because that comes in a glass jar here at the supermarket. Right. But, but for the traveler, you can buy these little mm -hmm. plastic tubes. I'll send you some. Well, actually, you don't need to right now because uh, when I ordered from this place in England, I knew it was going to take a while to ship. I ordered 10 jars. <laughs> so I'm stocked up for at least a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I do love That's it. I hysterical. have it almost every day. That's hysterical. Yeah. Oh, darling, well, it's been again, such Karen. a blessing and a joy to be on your show. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Absolutely. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>